This is the second part of the microbiology lecture uh, regarding um, fungal organization. This microbiology lecture should be listened to by uh, Biology 4310, uh, Senior Microbiology. And uh, this will complete Chapter 5. Uh, we won't build on to Chapter 6 uh, until I'm able to lecture in person. And we're starting with fungal organization. So, we talked about yeast and mold. Those are the two different versions of fungi. Okay, And yeasts look more like bacteria. Their col colonies have a soft uniform texture. Molds are cottony, hairy, or velvety. Okay. Uh, when you have molds, uh, which are also termed hypha in colonies, they are called mycelium. That is just a uh, more of a term. Uh, rather than calling it a colony, you call it mycelium. Okay. Septa are walls that will separate the hypha and the mycelium. Uh, these walls um, can be porous to allow for cell-to-cell -cell communication. Sometimes they're non-porous. Uh, hypha that are actively growing are called vegetative. Vegetative hypha are actively growing, visible. Um, and then spores are reproductive hypha. Um, and they are generally much, much smaller. Vegetative hypha, the hypha are long and thin. Spores are generally uh, spherical. Okay. Here in, on the left, it's staying blue, is Aspergillus niger. Aspergillus niger is normally black, and you can see the vegetative hypha below the stem, and then these um, just rows of spores, these chains of spores at the top, and the spores will be released in order to uh, reproduce, and uh, they will scatter and find uh, uh, places to land, hopefully with uh, nutritional support. Uh, the pink is Rhizopus orizae, uh, and Rhizopus um, forms a large uh, sac at the end of the vegetative hypha, and the sac at the end contains multiple spores. Okay, Vegetative hypha um, will generally grow at the surface uh, since mold, molds are uh, aerobic, and they will produce reproductive hypha. Reproductive hypha will um, release their spores. The spore is then uh, released into some type of media, uh, some type of nutrition source. It will form a germ tube. The germ, germ tube will form hypha. The hypha will uh, become more expensive, and then the cycle will be con continues. Okay. Um, many spores are asexual in molds. These are called sporan sporangiospores. Uh, those with a sac-like head, uh, like sporangiospores, is what we saw with uh, rhizopus, the, the pink stained fungus, and canidia spores. Canidia spores are free spores uh, that are released, and the free spores uh, we saw in Aspergillus, which was stained blue on the previous slide. There are sexual spore formation. Whoops, I have to go back a slide. Okay, hang on. And this is just a simple union of fertile hypha from two different strains. And sometimes there is sort of a male and a female structure um, in uh, some more advanced species of spores. Fungal infections we call mycosis. Mycosis can be yeast or mold. Uh, they can be uh, superficial, like tinea, uh, which would be athlete's foot or jock itch, and uh, dermatophytosis, uh, also yeast infections called candidiasis, 
and they can be very, very deep, like lung and skin infections can become very, very deep. Lung infections, uh, mold then can lead to severe respiratory problems. Uh, some beneficial fungus. Uh, yeast are used for fermentation. That's how we get beer and wine. That's how we make bread to rise. The good yeast, the baker's yeast that you get, uh, is Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Uh, that's when you buy a packet of baker's yeast in the store. That's what it is. Okay. Uh, beneficial mold, Aspergillus niger, actually makes citric acid. Uh, they have large reactors of this in Miles Laboratory. Um, in Elkhart, Indiana, and I got to visit that laboratory. Uh, this makes citric acid, um, which is part of Alka-Seltzer. And this is um, tinea, okay, stain pink. Okay. This is tinea cruris, or jock itch. And you can see it's very extensive here, okay? It's a, it's a, a superficial infection, but it can get quite severe. This is yeast, uh, showing the yeast starting to bud. And this is Candida alba cans. This is infective yeast. This is bad yeast, not good yeast. When you have a yeast infection, uh, this is the type of yeast typically that will be the infective agent. Next, let's go to protists. So we've talked about fungus. Next, we'll talk about protists. Uh, this is the kingdom protista. Uh, it's divided into two subkingdoms, algae and protozoa. Algae are photosynthetic, protozoa are non-photosynthetic. Okay. And a general definition, this is uh, any unicellular or colonial organism that lacks true tissues. Okay. And they do grow unicellularly. They also do grow in colonies. Uh, they do not form tissues, uh, so they don't have tissue levels of organization like you would find in a human being. Here's algae. This is a biofuel producing algae called Lovox. And here is algae in a lake that's undergone eutrophication. Eutrophication happens when uh, there's a release of nutrient like phosphate in uh, a lake or a stream. And the nutrient causes uh, rapid and very extensive growth of algae. The algae starves the aquifer of oxygen, and that causes other organisms like fish to die in the lake. Okay. Algae uh, has chloroplasts. Okay, you find algae in both freshwater and marine environments. Um, plankton are generally in uh, fresh and marine environments. This includes algae and protozoa. Okay. And different pathogens uh, would be like red tide. Uh, red tide is a type of algae that um, is, causes uh, paralytic poisoning. It accumulates in shellfish. And uh, red tide is characterized by, uh, there's just a red color to the algae. Uh, Prototheca causes skin uh, and subcutaneous infections, and uh, Fisteria pisida um, can release potent toxins, um, causing neurological symptoms and skin lesions. Uh, so there are pathogenic algae. In terms of protozoa, uh, in protozoa for locomotion, the cytoplasm is divided in ectoplasm and endoplasm. Ectoplasm is more of a clear outer layer and it allows the protozoan to move. Endoplasm is more the granular region and that's where you find most of the organelles. The endoplasm is closer to the nucleus, ectoplasm is further away on the external portion of the cell. Uh, the cell shape can remain constant uh, or it can change constantly. Um, like amoebas. Okay. Uh, protozoa are heterotrophs. Uh, they do not have um, chloroplasts, so they require complex organic food. Uh, they scavenge dead material, uh, so they're safe probes. Uh, they can also be parasitic and uh, graze on live cell matter. Uh, an example of a parasitic protozoan 
is the protozoan that causes uh, malaria. They can live in a very wide variety of environments. And uh, protozoa will form cysts. Uh, this is like a spore for bacteria. This is the dormant phase. And you need to know this definition and this term um, when uh, the uh, protozoan is deprived of nutrients uh, or under harsh conditions, then it can form a cyst uh, to allow it to survive long term. Um, in terms of locomotion, uh, protozoa uh, have cilia distributed all over the surface. Uh, this is primarily for paramecium. You'll also find flagella uh, attached to some cells, and this is eukaryotic flagella, so it moves in a whip-like fashion. You'll also see pseudopods, uh, or false feet. Um, you see this in amoebas. These are blunt uh, primarily, and uh, they're amorphous. Uh, some protozoa have branched or long pointed ones. Here's amoeba proteus, and you can see that it's formed pseudopods. It's got uh, several just small legs that it can push back and forth. And these are amorphous, and they can change. Okay. And here is paramecium, and you see the small hairs on the external portion of the cell, the cilia. This slide shows the life cycle of protozoa. And in that life cycle, let me get it back to full screen here, in that life cycle you start out with a trophozoite. Trophozoite is an active protozoan, uh, it's just uh, like akin to like vegetative bacteria. It's active, it's feeding, it has nutrition, it has uh, oxygen, and then uh, once it loses nutrition or uh, the environment dries out or becomes harsh, it starts to form a cyst. The cyst wall uh, then begins to thicken and uh, this uh, creates a home for the nucleus. It's basically preserving the DNA and the cyst is the dormant phase. Uh, this, once the cyst is rehydrated, uh, and nutrients are restored, the cyst wall will break open, and then the trophozoa will be reactivated. So, um, not all protozoa uh, will form cysts, um, but they all do exist, obviously, in the trophozoa phase. In terms of reproduction, uh, these uh, protozoa will reproduce very simply uh, by a cell division, just mitosis. Um, there um, are some host cells that will uh, replicate via multiple fission. However, there's also sexual reproduction that occurs in many protozoa, sort of a form of conjugation where uh, two ciliates, like uh, paramecium, will fuse and exchange micronuclei. Uh, this allows for genetic diversity, and uh, this uh, genetic diversity can contribute to survival during selection pressure. Okay, and here is uh, micronuclei uh, are in red. These are two uh, paramecia, and you can see that the micronuclei are um, um, dividing during meiosis. Um, and mitosis then causes uh, uh, one of the micronuclei to be exchanged, the others are degraded. Uh, these swap positions, okay, and then the cells separate and the micronuclei fuse together and this will ultimately fuse with the nucleus to create a macronucleus. And here are micronuclei. Uh, this is a macronucleus, and there are several small circular micronuclei here. So 
some medically important protozoa, uh, Mystigophora. Uh, you've heard of some of these. Uh, they have flagella. Um, they reproduce sexually and via mitosis. Uh, this includes giardia, which you get from uh, drinking contaminated water in the wild. Uh, it's transmitted uh, through animal feces. And then trichomonas, which is uh, transmitted um, through uh, sexual contact. Uh, it's not technically a sexually transmitted disease. Uh, sexual contact is one way it can be transmitted, uh, but uh, there are ways that you can get trichomonas without sexual contact. Okay. Uh, amoebas, um, these divide asexually just through uh, a sort of a, a type of fission. Um, most are free living, uh, just uh, the pond water amoebas like amoeba proteus are not parasitic. But Entamoeba um, is, a, is a genus that is pathogenic to humans. Uh, the one that's most uh, often heard of is Entamoeba histolytica, which uh, infects the intestines, can cause intestinal blockage, uh, damage, and inflammation. Uh, ciliates, uh, these are uh, called ciliophora. Um, the majority of ciliates are harmless. Uh, most have a mouth and a feeding organelle, so they do have a rudimentary structure. They're not technically animals, but they do have uh, a way for feeding. Okay, and then uh, sporozoa um, or apicomplexa are sexually reproduced, and uh, these are um, all uh, parasitic and include plasmodium. Uh, plasmodium is the um, active agent in malaria, and also Toxoplasma gondii for toxoplasmosis. You may have heard of toxoplasmosis being associated with um, cat feces, and uh, it's very important to avoid uh, cat feces during pregnancy because a toxoplasmosis infection can um, hurt the developing fetus. Uh, here's Giardia. You can see multiple flagella on Giardia. Um, this is, oh God, I want to say this trichomonas. Yes, that's trichomonas. Okay. Um, this is an amoeba. Okay. And this is Entamoeba histolytica. You have the amoeba colony in the cecum, in the intestines. And you have a tumor like mass that's blocking the intestines that includes uh, amoeba and uh, inflammatory cells. And with this blockage, then you have uh, vomiting, diarrhea, chronic illness. Um, it's very, very difficult to treat. It's very, very difficult to get rid of. Okay, okay here's plasmodium uh, in a background of red blood cells or erythrocytes. So uh, this is an infected cell that is infected with plasmodium. Okay, and that causes malaria. And here are some symptoms of malaria that you can look at. Um, we talk about malaria a lot because uh, we have students going overseas and uh, you have to be careful with, with uh, mosquito bites because mosquitoes carry the plasmodium protozoan and uh, therefore they can infect you directly. Mosquitoes are vectors, they're not true hosts. They do not get malaria, they only carry malaria. Okay, here's toxoplasmosis, okay, or toxoplasma gondii. Okay, and the pregnant woman never handles the kitty litter. Never, ever, ever. Okay, oh, now you remember meiosis. Meiosis uh, is um, the formation of gametes down here, and there's one nuclear division right up here, or one uh, and associated with one DNA replication, but there are two cell divisions. So you start out with um, two times the number of chromosomes are diploid at the top, and then by the time you get to the gametes, they're haploid. They only have one set of chromosomes at the bottom. Okay, so we call this a zygote here. Uh, the DNA can cross over during replication, and so you can get hybrid chromosomes. The blue one is from dad, the uh, red one is from mom. 
And so you can get a hybrid of dad with a little portion of mom or a hybrid of mom with a little portion of dad. Okay, after one cell division, the cells are still diploid because they have two chromosomes, only their own sister chromatids. Okay. Then after the second cell division, then the cells become haploid. And then finally you have free gametes. And syngamy is just a process of two gametes coming together to form a zygote. Uh, some other protozoan pathogens, uh, trypanosomes, uh, these uh, have flagella and uh, they cause uh, sleeping sickness. Trypanosoma brucei, Trypanosoma cruzi causes Chagas disease, and uh, these are transmitted by vectors, uh, primarily insects. Okay, and a vector, like I said before, is an e intermediate host. It's not a true host or a uh, final host, and it just is active in transmitting the disease. And here is um, an insect that is a vector. Uh, here's somebody that has uh, uh, Chagas disease here. And uh, this is uh, an example. I'm sorry, this is uh, sleeping sickness, okay? And here's Chagas disease. This is a, a cross-section of a heart that has been attacked. Uh, you see lots of problems with the tissues uh, in Chagas. Okay. And amoeba is a type of protozoan pathogen. It causes amoebic dysentery, or what's called amoebiasis. Uh, this is specifically called by this, caused by the species Entamoeba histolytica. Um, the organism is nearly always associated with human. Humans is transmitted in the feces, and so you have to be very, very careful when you're drinking untreated water, when you're drinking water overseas, primarily in tropical regions. Uh, the cysts, um, will exist in a nutrient-poor environment uh, in the colon, and uh, the trophozoites uh, are more in invasive in the intestines. And uh, the cysts are in food and water that have been contaminated with feces. They enter the stomach, they survive the stomach because they're cysts and they can survive the low pH. The trophozoites are then release in the intestines, they become mature, uh, and then uh, in, the, um, in the colon and in the rectum, then they uh, are in a less nutrient-rich environment. They form cysts again, and the cysts are found in the feces. There are also parasitic helmets. Uh, helmets include flatworms. Uh, their uh, flatworms are very thin and flat and they have a segmented body. Uh, there are two types of flatworm cestodes, which are tapeworms, and they can be very, very long. Uh, there are termitodes. Termitodes are often called flukes. Uh, they have flat ovoid, ovoid bodies and, and two eyes in the tops of their bodies. Okay. Roundworms are uh, elongated, and they're unsegmented, and they're called nematodes. Okay? And if you look at um, the typical architecture of a helmet, you can see that um, there are a lot of features here that you would find in humans. Um, there's a mouth, there's an anus, there's the um, uh, gastrointestinal system, um, testes, uh, sperm duct, sperm, um, many, many things. And so they become difficult to treat because uh, their physiology is close enough to humans that uh, the treatment for helmets can have side effects for humans. Okay. Here's a fluke. Uh, fluke has its mouth down here, intestines, and I believe that its mouth and its anus are the same place. It basically just eats and poops out of the same place. Okay. Here's some flukes. You can see their cute eyes. They're just uh, roaming around. Okay. Here is a round worm that has been uh, taken from intestines. Okay. And all helmets have fertilized eggs. Uh, the fertilized eggs, once they hatch, become larvae, and then the larvae mature into adults. Uh, the majority of helmets reproduce sexually in the host body. Uh, 
uh, nematodes, the sexes are different. Uh, you have individual male and female with gender features. Uh, trematodes, um, which are a type of flatworm, the sexes can be different or you can have hermaphroditic. You have the same organism that has both male and female parts. And cestodes um, are generally hermaphroditic. Okay? So they have both male and female parts in the same organism. Um, the egg and the larva can be transmitted to the same or the different host. This is again a fecal or oral route. Okay. Uh, the larva development occurs in the intermediate host or in the final host. Um, adulthood and mating occur in what we call the final or definitive host. This is where the eggs are going to be laid. And the host can be the same or different. You can have an intermediate host for larval development or you can have the same host uh, for um, uh, the entire life cycle. Transport host is an intermediate host that suffers no ill effects. This would be a type of vector, and there are vectors in helminth. And the mating cycle, interestingly enough, is lunar. So people with helminth infections um, uh, tend to go a little crazy during um, a full moon. You've heard that before. Uh, if anybody's worked in the emergency room, people dread the full moon because there's more emergencies on full moon night. Uh, the mating cycle of helminths is, turns out, is lunar. Okay. So here's a type of helminth called the pinworm. Pinworms are endemic in Southern California. Uh, it's just a great environment to grow pinworms. Uh, these, um, here's a, a little boy ingesting pinworms. Okay. He's ingests an egg. The larva hatches in the intestines, and then it matures in the intestines. Okay, and then breeding happens in the intestines uh, as well. Okay. Um, Gravid worms, gravid needs pregnant. Pregnant worms migrate to the rectum, um, and the pinworms then um, lay their eggs in the perianal region. Okay, looks something like this here. Some uh, uh, worms that have laid their eggs in the perianal region, and here's um, a, a photomicrograph of a pinworm. They're very, very small. They're very white. Uh, usually to diagnose them, you take a piece of tape and you just uh, adhere the pinworms from the perianal region and you can see the worms directly. You might look at them under a microscope, but you can see them with the naked eye, um, uh, although they are quite small. Again, uh, these are problems with specifically with children. Uh, whenever you have poor hand washing practices, uh, you also find pinworms um, infecting uh, uh, children who are malnourished uh, because their immune system is uh, is compromised uh, because of the lack of nutrition, and so the pinworms uh, do not have defenses fighting against them. Okay. And there are about 50 parasitic helminth species in humans. Okay, uh, you these worms grow uh, better in a tropical region because cold weather is not something that they tolerate. Uh, but they do co-migrate with human hosts. So if a human is infected with helminths, then there can be helminth outbreaks wherever that human being goes. Okay. There's about 50 million helminth infections per year. Uh, that's a lot considering that our population is 300 million. Okay. And the primary target, like I said before, is malnourished children. Okay. So let's talk about the two different types of fungi. Uh, that is... I'll tell you in a minute. Okay. The two different types of protists. And what do algae have that protozoa don't? What is a cyst in microbiological terms? And what is the definitive or final health for host for helmets? Okay, let me go back a slide. So the two types of fungi. Hopefully you got this right. Molten yeast. Two types of protists. Algae and protozoa. 
and algae have chloroplasts. Protozoa do not. Okay. The cyst, in microbiological terms, is the dormant form of a protozoan. And then the definitive host for helminths. This is the final host for helminths. This is um, specified for the adult stage of helminths, and um, where they mate. And so this is uh, where mating and primarily where eggs are laid. Okay, and that concludes chapter five, and that concludes my lecture podcast.